Space Flight Center uh, really stimulated his early interest in astronomy and space. Uh, he got his BS in physics degree uh, from the University of Alabama Huntsville and then went to the University of Florida where he received uh, MS and PhD, PhD degrees. Um, and studied the radio emissions uh, from the planet Jupiter and his uh, research there. He was also a National Research Council postdoctoral fellow at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And he's now a professor of physics and astronomy <clears throat> at Middle Tennessee State University. He's a, a founding member of the NASA sponsored project called Radio Jove and it's been going for about 20 years with the goal of using radio astronomy to help students, teachers, and the general public get involved in science. Uh, he also enjoys hiking in many of the great state parks uh, in Tennessee. So um, tonight he's going to talk to us about a little different topic than uh, most of us focus on the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and he's going to tell us about the Radio Jove Project and the NASA Citizen Science. So uh, with that, I'll welcome Chuck to uh, give us the, uh, this very interesting sounding talk. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. It's good to see uh, some known fam and familiar faces. Uh, it's been a few years since I, uh, I gave a talk last time and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to see you. It's, it's, this is a bit strange, isn't it? Um, we're all getting good, we're pretty good at these Zoom, Zoom meetings, but face-to-face um, uh, -face and uh, would certain, certainly uh, be, be, be a lot better, but this is, uh, it's worked out pretty good. I, I've been telling colleagues that I, I'm impressed, you know, MTSU, we went remote classes starting uh, right after spring break, and I've been quite impressed with the infrastructure uh, of the internet and uh, some of our um, services that we use at the university, we've not had any problems, major outages or problems. So I, I've been fairly impressed with uh, uh, everybody who built the internet, I guess. <laughs> it's held up pretty well. I guess I'll share my screen if that's okay. Uh, I hope to uh, uh, keep this to about 40 or 45 minutes, uh, maybe maybe a bit less. Um, my goal is to, uh, to remind many of you, but maybe introduce to some of you, some, uh, the Radio Jove project, something I've been working on for quite a while, and then um, briefly talk about some of the education partners that we have, and then uh, switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about the science that we've been doing, and then more broadly, some of uh, the citizen science that um, NASA is really promoting and uh, give you some resources to, to find that because uh, there's a lot out there and I just wanted to highlight a few things to make you aware of it and uh, maybe get you excited or, or uh, some people you know, you might, might be quite interested in some of these uh, projects. Uh, I'll start uh, yeah. by talking about Radio Jove, and then I'll, I'll kind of move into more of the citizen science stuff. But uh, as Don mentioned, thank you, Don. Uh, I am teaching at uh, Middle Tennessee State, and I've been there for now. Um, I just finished my 19th year, and I would have to say it's probably been the, uh, the, the strangest year uh, since I've been teaching. Um, but we all survived and we're, uh, we're hanging in there. I hope you guys are too, staying healthy and safe. Let's see, is this gonna... Oh, there we go. So <clears throat> Radio Jove started in, uh, while I was at NASA Goddard as a postdoc uh, in the late 90s. And we started beta testing um, radio receivers and uh, kind of formally got started in 1999. And the, the goal here is to get people interested in radio astronomy and in science in general, but use radio astronomy as the vehicle. And uh, so we sell these kits all over the world. The kits are a couple hundred dollars 
and and uh, they they operate at a single frequency. And you see, we've we've sold over 2,400 of these things, so it's on the order of 80 or 90 a year. And uh, we have sold them to. Uh, We've got people as uh, uh, as young as seventh and eighth graders get involved in this, but it, we target high school um, teachers and students, but uh, certainly colleges, universities, and uh, more advanced students. And now citizen science has really become uh, more of a focus for us. So here's a, a, the, the one slide overview of, of sort of the hardware the, on the left you see the, the, the standard Radio Joe receiver and the, the double dipole antenna that comes with the kit and, and then the uh, snapshot of what the software looks like. Um, so the, the idea here, and uh, Dick Flagg, who many of you uh, know from, from SARA, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, um, designed this receiver. He's a radio engineer and uh, he designed it with the idea in mind that you build it, right? You get your hands dirty, you learn how to solder, you, you know, like you build your old crystal radios. So he wanted that kind of experience. And so we got together and put together uh, manuals and designed a, an antenna that would be simple enough to, to, to uh, build from a beginner and uh, um, fairly cheap parts to build this antenna. And uh, so it's just wires and coaxial cable. So it's, it's really pretty, pretty basic, but it works, right? The receiver is uh, tuned to about 20 megahertz, which is uh, um, the, the, um, a, a, a very good frequency for observing Jupiter and solar um, radio emissions. So the idea is that you build the receiver, you operate it, then you go ahead and collect some data and the software, as you see here from Jim Sky at radiosky.com, it's a strip chart uh, recorder and it allows you to do some analysis so you can analyze the data and then we have a data archive. And then you know, the upshot is that you can participate and do some science. Um, and you see the whole, the whole kit, if you were gonna get involved with this at sort of this beginner or basic level, is a few hundred dollars, but you, you have to have your own computer for, uh, for recording the data. So not too bad uh, in terms of expense, but the, you see the antenna is fairly large. So we have a single dipole will work for solar radio astronomy and you, know, you can pick, the, pick up solar radio emissions quite, quite easily, but to pick up a Jupiter to any, uh, uh, high probability you need a second antenna to increase the gain a little bit. And uh, you, uh, you need about uh, 20, uh, sorry, about 30 by 30 feet of space to set up this antenna. And that does limit people uh, to some extent. Um, I need to, uh, but before I go on, let me, let me change my view here so I can see, because I can't see everybody on my view here. Okay, now I can. I was going to say, if anybody has a question, uh, now I can see you. Um, feel free to step in or uh, raise your hand and I'll uh, uh, stop. Be, I'm glad to stop and, uh, and answer any questions. Yeah, Don? Uh, so, how do you, maybe you're going to tell us this, but how do you determine whether you're seeing solar or uh, Jovian? Uh, activity on this right right that's a that's a great question the um the jupiter as i'll, I'll play you a, a a sound file um here, here in a few minutes but jupiter has a distinct um uh look and a distinct sound if you if you um record it and play it back in on, on the audio spectrum you you know it's jupiter by um the way it sounds and and when it was first discovered, um, hey John, good to see you. Um, when when Jupiter was first discovered, they they thought it was interference, and then, like, you know, any good scientist, they go back and look at the record and realize that hey, there's something uh, that 
that is it's not interference. They ruled out interference. And uh, you point the antenna on and off your target, just like you would do sort of in a visible, uh, in the visible spectrum to confirm that you're getting emissions from Jupiter. So distinct look on the, spec, uh, on the strip chart and also a distinct um, signature. And as you can see, if you have a spectrograph system, a more expensive uh, system, you, Jupiter and solar emissions have a certain spectral signature that you can identify them that way as well. So uh, in the last oh, uh, 10 years or so, we've, we've slowly built up our capacity here. Um, we are uh, doing more spectral um, uh, radio and, uh, recordings and analysis. So Dick Flagg built a, a spectrograph, an analog spectrograph, and then um, we use a wideband antenna. So it's a, it's a uh, dipole antenna, but it's a folded dipole. So you can see it here in this uh, background uh, image there. And it's a square array. So there's four dipoles there, and they're connected together such that the east, west, and the north, south dipoles connect together so we can uh, record circularly polarized uh, emissions because um, Jupiter emits its radio emissions um, via the uh, cyclotron mechanism, so spiraling electrons and magnetic fields. So it is highly uh, circularly or elliptically polarized. So the antennas uh, work better if they're um, uh, po uh, polarimeters. So we can, we can detect both right and left hand um, emissions with this square array setup. And uh, of course, uh, the, that antenna is a little more expensive. The spectrographs are much more expensive. And the software that comes with it is uh, also um, designed by Jim Sky. And it's a spectral uh, frequency versus time um, uh, view that you see there. And so you, in this case, the solar radio emissions there, you can really observe a lot of spectral structure. And uh, you see, uh, we're in the thousands of dollars uh, of hardware cost for, for doing uh, this kind of work. And what we're, what we're moving into, Radio Jove in particular, is going to move into the more scientific realm and more citizen, doing more citizen science. So these um, um, setups, these spectral, uh, the spectrograph setups are really helping us in that, in that regard. Um, <clears throat> we are trying to improve uh, the cost of these things. We're trying to, to reduce the cost of these things by using these uh, software-defined radios. Those are much, much cheaper. And you can use a very simple dipole like for the Radio Jove and, uh, and an SDR receiver, which is a couple hundred dollars, and a, and a dipole, which is a couple hundred dollars, or actually less than that. And you can actually um, get... Um, Make, make a spectrograph that's not too expensive. Now, the, the, the limiting factor there is that the dipoles and uh, the bandwidth is not gonna be as wide as perhaps maybe you'd like. So we're, we're trying to operate anywhere between 15 and 30 megahertz. Again, that's where Jupiter's uh, very active and, and then the sun is uh, also a broadband emitter in that, in that realm. And in, in doing that, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but in doing that, we're also looking into uh, trying to better understand what the ionosphere is doing. As, as you know, uh, the ionosphere cutoff um, is somewhere between 10 and 15 megahertz. And uh, so we're right at the bottom end uh, or, the, or the top end, depending on your, your view of, of the ionosphere, uh, that cutoff, so we can use that to uh, probe what the ionosphere is doing at different locations uh, on, on the Earth. So anyway, that's the two uh, sets of hardware that we're focused on, and uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the science that we're trying to do with those. Okay, uh, if I can figure out how to move my screen, there we go. So, <clears throat> the uh, few of the projects that we do, uh, again, are 
studying Jupiter. So I've been, uh, I did that for my uh, dissertation at Florida. Florida had a lo has a long history of uh, Jupiter observations. And uh, so we branched into doing solar radio observations and then ionosphere um, studies. And then even looking at uh, uh, the Milky Way, what's the Milky Way background look like at 20 megahertz or at the, within the HF band? So we're in the midst of trying to design some projects that citizens can do, students can do, teachers um, can do uh, guided uh, projects that they can do to, first of all, you know, introduce them to radio astronomy and, and, and science in general, but then maybe guide them into actually doing some science, citizen science that could be uh, published. So, <clears throat> you know, a simple thing would be just to you know, get your equipment working, right? That's, that's the first step is getting your radio telescope working, um, making observations that you know are legit, and that comes with comparing your observations with others. That's the, the best way to let you know that something that you picked up is really a solar burst or a Jupiter burst, because chances are somebody else picked it up as well. And then of course, local interference and those kinds of things would not be picked up uh, simultaneously by widely separated um, uh, radio observatories. So, you can do some very simple things, but then with the spectrographs, you can do a little bit more um, advanced projects. And I like to show this, this figure on the right here because it just shows you what um, the spectral data look like. This is for a, a solar burst or a series of solar bursts. And uh, Radio Jove at a single frequency would be, you know, that horizontal cut through the spectral uh, plot there and then you can see the intensity versus time graph there at, at, the, at the Jove 20.1 megahertz frequency. And if, as Don mentioned, you know, at the, at the beginning, uh, you know, the, the, uh, one of the great things about radio astronomy, you know, you're just examining the universe in a different part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So we're, we're trying to learn something different than you could you know, using your eyeballs. So uh, it really does, you know, broaden our understanding of the physics, the, the, the physical nature of what the universe and what, what things are doing. So by um, observing at different, uh, uh, different parts of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, we can uh, learn new and hopefully exciting things. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I just wanted to um, uh, let you know that Radio Jove uh, in the last four years has, has become part of a citizen science uh, education consortium. And that's run uh, actually through NASA headquarters, but uh, the um, partners that we uh, work with is through NASA Goddard in, in Maryland. And there's 26 other um, groups that uh, are part of this consortium all over the country. And uh, again, the goal is to try to um, uh, teach, educate people about science and STEM subjects, and then also try to recruit people to learn more and do more um, in citizen science projects. Um, we are part of this NSSEC, National Space Science Education Consortium, and so uh, we have a grant through NASA to um, help fund some of our hardware and help recruit new uh, citizen scientists to join us in, in, our, um, in our efforts. So currently, as you can see from the map, um, we have um, 12 working um, sometimes, they're not all working simultaneously. That's part of the you know, technical problems, as you, as you guys know. Um, these are the, uh, the, the, the folks that are working with us right now that have uh, a spectrograph station. So we've got lots and lots of uh, people that have a Radio Joe station, but we're trying to um, get spectral, uh, spectrograph stations more well-established, and those might come through uh, individuals, uh, certainly, but maybe institutions. And then through the institutions, we um, can recruit 
uh, citizens to help us either take data, analyze data, uh, or set up Radio Jove um, stations in their uh, on their property to help corroborate some of the uh, observations that are made. So we've got um, uh, several in Florida, obviously, and then um, mine here at uh, in Murfreesboro, and, and several in um, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, there in Pennsylvania, New Mexico, one in Alaska, and one in Hawaii. So uh, the one in Hawaii is through Windward Community College, so that's a, a, a well-established station, although they're, they're in the midst of, and have been for many, many years, a lot of RFI. But uh, we are uh, always looking and, and trying to recruit new institutions to be partners or uh, individuals to, to help join us to um, help uh, make, make more measurements. Now, the, um, we've, over the years, we've worked uh, uh, very well with the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, so the CERA group. We uh, attend their meetings semi-frequently, and uh, they've been a great partner for us and, and resource um, to help um, um, recruit people and share information. So it's, that's, been, that's been really, really good. Um, we also have sort of an informal uh, partnership with the, the Juno spacecraft. Um, so there, that spacecraft, as you uh, know, is orbiting Jupiter. And part of that is uh, there is a radio antenna that monitors some of the radio emissions and particularly, you know, trying to locate exactly where they're coming from uh, near the pole of Jupiter. And so they have the near field view and uh, we are taking data. Uh, many of our uh, observers are uh, observing 24 seven. So in case there's something interesting that they want to, uh, the Juno folks want to uh, look at ground-based data, we have sort of an informal partnership that they would contact us if they, would like any of our data. And then we have sort of uh, recently started archiving these more scientifically, you know, valid spectral data at the uh, planetary data system through uh, UCLA and, and other um, uh, data archives. So those are our sort of partners at the moment. So um, citizen science, I mean, there's no strict definition of it, but uh, this is the one that came off the NASA site. Uh, it's essentially a collaboration between a scientist and an interested member of the public, right? And it's as simple as that. And, uh, you know, it's a great way to engage uh, people, students, teachers. Um, and uh, this is some basic information about the uh, Space Science uh, Education Consortium and uh, you know, some of the projects that are involved there. And you see under citizen science, uh, Radio Jove is listed. And uh, you know, there's a, a whole multitude of uh, informal education, formal education, um, you know, family science night where you just engage um, children and, and get them interested. So there's a whole platform of, uh, of uh, um, citizen science uh, uh, and uh, education tools through this education consortium. <clears throat> now, uh, one of our, <laughs> one of our uh, observers, and uh, several of them actually are um, darn near professionals. They, they have really gone overboard and uh, using some of their equipment. And this is one of our guys in, in, uh, in Georgia, Larry Dodd. And uh, this is his, uh, uh, wall, I guess, and you can you can see um, if you're familiar with the SDR, the the, the uh, receivers there on the on the lower left. He's got a couple of these SDRs, a couple of computers that he's got um, mounted to the um, to the uh, the wall he's got here. He's got a uh, on the right this Radio Joe receiver, and so he's got a, a fairly s slick setup. And uh, three monitors there, where he's he's recording uh, uh, with multiple antennas and multiple receivers. So uh, it's, I guess it's it certainly can be addicting for for some people once you get involved in this kind of stuff, right? In a good way, in a good way. 
Um, so you you guys I know have heard heard this or or seen this. Um, okay, I'm admitting people as I as I pop up on the screen here. Um, you've probably seen this. Uh, so this is what a typical solar burst looks like at, at a single frequency and uh, um, you know here's you know several pictures showing you what the sun would look like in, in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and I'll play this see if I can play this sound I don't know if you'll be able to hear it or not I'm not hearing anything. Is that coming through? I'm not hearing anything. Is anybody else? I heard a few clicks, but that's it. I'm not either. I was almost tempted to try to recreate it vocally, but it's done. Yeah, it may, it may just not, not be possible here to do it. But essentially, you're seeing the, um, the, um, the, the galactic background there. So the bottom of the trace is... Uh, what we call the galactic background at 20 megahertz. And so that is uh, pervasive uh, electromagnetic radiation coming from the Milky Way galaxy. So these are um, electrons that are spiraling in the galactic magnetic field. And so that is our baseline. So anything on top of that, uh, we can uh, hopefully identify that and uh, attribute it to some source. So in this case, uh, the sun and so you get a typical um, uh, increase in intensity there, uh, a much more rapid increase and a, a slower fallback over um, seconds or, or even minutes in, in some cases um, for, for solar bursts. <clears throat> so those are fairly easy to pick up, but uh, of course, as you can imagine, that just depends on the sun, depends on the solar cycle. And um, these are very unpredictable. And uh, Jupiter has uh, several um, types of uh, emissions that it, that it uh, gives off. And I've just got, I'm just showing you one here. There's, there's a long burst and short burst. And uh, they, each one of them have a slightly different signature and uh, a spectral signature as well. So they sound different. And you can actually record these things at high speeds and play them back. And you can get some, uh, uh, you learn something about uh, the physics that's going on from, uh, at the source. And so this, this figure at the right, this cartoon at the right, is, shows you Jupiter and, uh, and the moon Io, and then the plasma Taurus uh, around uh, Jupiter there. David, you had a question? Uh, just a comment. Chuck, if you, if you, did want to play any of your audio clips, any of your WAV files, there's probably a way to do it. And that is if you look in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, there's a, a box that says turn on original sound. If you do that, that may route the, uh, the WAV files to the Zoom session from that point on. It'll be in the upper left-hand section, a uh, portion of your screen. Oh, I see a, a thing that says share computer sound. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that one. I would say turn on original sound is, uh, is what I was thinking. That, that can somehow do that. I, I think the one he mentioned is the right one. I'm not sure. All right. Why don't I give it a try? I'm going to share my sounds here, and I'm going to play this. Following is Jovian Esper's activity. You can hear that? So those pops and things that you heard is that are actually uh, uh, very intense bursts that are coming from um, the magnetosphere, magnetic field of, uh, of Jupiter. And these are um, uh, highly, uh, uh, what's the word, they're, they're uh, 
tuned. They're, they're, they're electrons that are uh, moving in resonance. And so therefore you get uh, an, an intense burst of energy coming from there. And if you record it at high speeds, you can play it back at, uh, at low, uh, uh, slow it down. And here's what it sounds like. So those uh, whistles that you're hearing from from high to low uh, are indicative of what what Jupiter uh, what the electrons are do, doing in Jupiter's magnetosphere. So again, going back to this cartoon, you uh, there, there's two sources of plasma. Basically, you have the solar wind plasma. So that's uh, we see that at the Earth. There's radio emissions uh, that that Earth generates because of that, and of course the aurora, and so. Uh, Jupiter has the same the same thing. Anytime you have a plasma interacting with a magnetosphere, you're going to get particle trapping, uh, acceleration, and then precipitation down to the atmosphere, and, and you get uh, auroral signatures. So the same mechanisms where you get the aurora, you're getting um, radio emissions as well. So it's the solar wind, and then uniquely, it seems, it's, so far, uniquely, at Jupiter, we have this really interesting electrical connection between the moon Io and, and the plasma be, being volcanic. It emits neutral particles that, uh, that uh, get ionized almost immediately by the, the solar UV light. And then it creates this big donut of plasma around it. And the magnetic field lines then that uh, perme permeate that part of uh, space where the plasma is, then those electrons are, are sort of free to move along the, the field lines and you get an, an enhancement of radio emission due to uh, the presence of, of IO. And so we can actually predict these things to a, a certain degree. And uh, when, based on where Jupiter is in its rotation and where IO is in its orbit, we actually have some predictions that we can make to uh, uh, have a better chance of picking up some of these uh, Jovian emissions. Yeah, Don. Yeah, um, these the sound kind of like the uh, the whistlers that we have in our own ionosphere, uh, but they would be, of course, they are more in the audible frequency range. So I don't. I guess you wouldn't have to have this factor of 128 slowdown. Can Can you explain that factor based on the field, the magnetic field, or plasma densities around Jupiter or something? Yes, yes. So um, these electrons are um, kilo electron volt energy. So they're moving, um, they're not, not relativistic, but they're moving pretty fast. And uh, so what we do is uh, we record the, um, the spectral signature in uh, the decametric, the, you know, 20 megahertz, and then, you know, shift it down to the audio and preserve the, uh, the spectral characteristics, but the slowdown that you're, the, so, 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 so the audio that you heard, the, the S-burst, the popping thing, so, so that is just simply taking the, um, the data and shifting it into the audio part of the spectrum and preserving the, the spectral characteristics. But uh, the, the slowdown is just allowing you to, um, it's allowing you to understand that the electrons are moving from a, a higher uh, magnetic field to a lower one, meaning these electrons are actually being, they, they get mirrored. Once they go down towards the, um, in, certain, in certain cases, once they get down towards the pole, they'll actually stop and get mirrored backwards. So it's, it's sort of like a, um, uh, a magnetic bottle. So it's, it's the, the, the field lines that when they come together, they create a magnetic bottle. And so these, these uh, electrons, when they spiral down, some of them uh, go through the end of the bottle and all the way down to the atmosphere and cause aurora. Some of these things get um, uh, mirrored backwards. And so uh, by... Uh, analyzing this at uh, 
uh, high speed and playing it back slower, we, we now know that the electrons that, that are emitting, doing the emitting, are actually coming, uh, are the mirrored electrons, the ones that are coming back up the field line from a higher magnetic field to a lower one. So as you move away from Jupiter, the, 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 the magnetic field strength decreases. And so the, the cone that you see there, so uh, they've sort of mapped where uh, the emission's coming from, and it's, um, it's an open cone structure where the emission is beamed, and uh, it's centered on these, these field lines. So it's, it's the, 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 the pitch and the, and the whistle is due to the electrons moving outward uh, after they've mirrored. So that, that's pretty interesting that we can know that by, by studying these uh, in the audio. Hey, John, did you have a question? Why, why is, is it only um, producing the, um, the whistlers, so to speak, on the mirrored electrons? It should do it in both directions. And if so, there should be some standing waves also. And I'm wondering if any of that has been observed. Yeah, so, uh, that's an that's a, a excellent point. So as the electrons go down the field line, you should expect them to emit as well. But uh, the way the cone, uh, it, the emission works, it's not quite 90 degrees off the field line. It's, 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 it's got this open cone structure. So it would be uh, uh, going towards Jupiter and, and, and the emission Essentially, we don't pick it up. We think it's probably there, but we don't pick it up because it's beamed away from us. And people have looked at this, and we think there, there might be some reflections um, at the Jupiter ionosphere, and some of the emission might be reflected backwards uh, or refracted backwards, but it gets very jumbled, and it's hard to know then where those emissions are actually coming from. And I, I think that's part of, you know, what the, the Juno mission is, is, is working on, is trying to sort of deconvolve where all these, uh, and of course, multiple field lines can be active uh, at once too. So it's not just a single field line that's emitting in one single cone. There's multiple cones that, that, that potentially are emitting all the, uh, at the same time. And so it gets, quite um, messy to try to uh, figure out where these emissions are coming from. But, but I agree with you. I think the, the, the emission is happening, but we just don't see it on the, on the downside. Bob? Uh, is it possible that as, as the electrons spiral in, you're getting one circularly polarized light, and as it goes out, it's the other handedness? Yes, uh, uh, that's, that's very true. I should have mentioned that, but uh, that's right. So the, the, the way the electrons are spiraling will, will, will give you the handedness, and that, that, that is right. And so we do see both polarizations, but, but again, we're, we're seeing mixed polarization because not only do you have the northern hemisphere emitting mostly right-hand circularly polarized, then equivalently, the southern hemisphere would be emitting left-hand polarized. And it's the same field line or the, uh, similar field lines that could be, could be active. Um, but then as, as the, uh, say, a right-hand circular polarized wave would be moving, say, towards Jupiter and get sort of maybe refracted or sort of reflected back, um, it would come come out as left-hand polarized. But again, is that due to wh where is that coming from? You know, it, it's it's they haven't been able to unravel all the the uh, sort of the intric intricacies of of where these um, uh, emission cones are are coming from, and uh, to to know that we're getting um, emission that's been reflected. But but you uh, the. the the antennas are sensitive to both either right or left circularly polarized light. Is that right? Yes. I thought earlier you said that it was 
tuned for one, but that's that's okay. That's the answer. Yeah, the more advanced antennas are going to pick up both. Now, the simple radio Joe antenna is a linearly polarized antenna, oh. so of course it's going to pick up a little yeah. both. And yeah. so uh, you have to have uh, uh, a polarized antenna to actually know which source is which. And the more advanced telescopes, the arrays and things like that, you can actually determine use the polarization to to determine where the emission is coming from, the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so uh, just more a little bit, uh, a little bit more about some of the projects that we're doing. So this, this gives you a, 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 the colored picture in the middle here gives you the view um, of what we call the radio sources at, at Jupiter. So what we're plotting here on the y-axis is um, the location of Io in its orbit uh, around Jupiter. And then the x-axis is the Jovian longitude. And through um, essentially statistics, you, you can build up this map and you make it a probability map. So where are the likely spots or where are the likely times um, do you pick up uh, you have a greater probability of detecting Jupiter emissions. And so these um, contours tell us, tell us that. And so uh, through um, more advanced, you know, uh, research and, and a lot of data, they, um, we now know that the IO um, A and the IO B, so the, the, the two most probable zones there are coming from northern hemisphere sources and then there's sort of a uh, uh, similar set of sources in the southern hemisphere and those are uh, IOC and IOD and uh, those are left-hand polarized. So the uh, uh, this occurrence probability map is what, what we call it and we can use that to uh, predict when uh, the configuration of Io and Jupiter will be um, in this region where the chances of us picking it up on Earth are, are higher than, than average. So that's a way for us to predict um, future uh, uh, Jovian emissions. And the, the graph on the right just shows you, um, in this case, one observer Oh, uh, no, that's not true. That's not true. I thought it was uh, Dave Topinski down in Florida, but no, it's multiple observers um, plotted on this occurrence probability map and uh, through um, multiple, multiple observations, you can build up these statistics and calculate what the probability of uh, picking up Jupiter at uh, any particular time. So that... Uh, uh, individuals can add to these large databases these these kind of plots and help us, you know, refine our predictions, uh, if if you will. So we can we can of course uh, look at the sources and better understand these sources. And uh, if you have a spectral system, you can actually look at the microstructure of, of Jupiter's emission. And then um, there are some people that would like to use a, a, a Jupiter radio wave and understand radio wave propagation either as it comes through the ionosphere or in the case if the if the geometry is correct if Jupiter is sort of on the other side of the sun compared to earth so uh, we would call that a conjunction right in, in astronomy that's when the two sources are in the same part of the sky it's a conjunction when the two sources are opposite earth call that the opposition. So when Jupiter and the sun are sort of close together in the sky and, and say Jupiter emits a radio wave, well, we can use that radio wave to sort of probe um, the solar corona and understand how, uh, what the plasma is doing to that radio wave. So it's, uh, uh, you can do a lot of, uh, of interesting science um, with this. This graph uh, is a spectral, uh, spectral graph showing you uh, uh, Jovian emissions, 
And then the one below it just shows you uh, the single frequency look of a strip chart of what these uh, uh, emissions are. And uh, uh, here you can see two, well, you can see the spectral structure in this, and that's typical of Jupiter. Uh, it's very bursty in, in nature, but you can also see, see two interesting uh, propagation structures. First of all, um, you can see they're, they're very nearly horizontal lines in this uh, emission. And those horizontal lines are um, Faraday bands. So as the right and left circular polarized wave goes through Earth's ionosphere, they arrive at different times. So you're seeing the evidence of Earth's ionosphere there. And then if you look closely, you can see a little more steeply sloped lines in this, uh, the, uh, in this emission. And that happens to be, um, uh, we call them modulation lanes, but these are structures caused by the plasma uh, near where the emission is happening. And, and in particular, we think it's uh, in the Io Taurus. So the plasma that makes up the Io Taurus causes these sloped um, emissions in this in the spectral plot there. So you can, you, it gives you kind of an idea of, of what you can what you can do with some of the um, uh, more advanced emissions. And here shows you uh, uh, a type three solar burst that we picked up at many locations, um, Tennessee, Florida, and Pennsylvania. And so you can see the, uh, the, the lower edge cutoff. That tells you something about the, the plasma, um, where the burst of, of energy is emitted near the sun surface, near, uh, typically near sunspots, solar flares, those kinds of things. So that gives you an indication of what's happening locally um, and then uh, you see some other interesting aspects of um, the differences in the emission that we're getting at the different sites. Assuming everybody's calibrated correctly, that can tell you something about the Earth's ionosphere. How absorptive is the Earth's ionosphere at one site versus the other site? And that changes the intensity of the emission that we see. And uh, uh, something that I have been working on with some students is uh, I am interested, let me go forward and I'll come back to this plot, but I am interested uh, in what are the long-term um, statistics of solar burst counts at, uh, in the HF band. So you recognize this um, sort of the middle plot there, that's the sunspot number in blue. And uh, that's uh, a monthly, sunspot number. So it's very erratic as you can see and then it's got a smooth uh, smooth fit on top of it and then uh, since the mm, gosh 80s or 90s I think they've been observing um, the solar radio flux at uh, 10 centimeters. So you see down there that's uh, about 28 megahertz, 2800 megahertz and uh, and that follows the sunspot number quite quite well. Um, so we, we know that when the sun is active, when there's lots of sunspots, when the, uh, where we're close to solar maximum, we get a lot of um, solar flares, coronal ejections, that kind of thing. Well, the, all those, all that activity, magnetic activity leads to um, solar radio bursts. And so I wanted to establish a, a, um, a um, solar, uh, HF band, solar radio, in this case is 20, 20 megahertz data um, of solar radio burst counts. And uh, we're still in the process of sort of refining this a, a little bit, but we've got pretty good correlation there. Um, and I'm hoping that I gotta go figure out how do I go backwards now. Oh, there we go. So what, I, what I'm trying to, to, to do and get students to do is actually look at data and count them. Simply look at, uh, it's not 24 hours because we only, we only uh, are interested in the data when the sun is above the horizon. So we look at 12 hours worth of data say and just simply count how many solar bursts do you see and uh, we'll do a monthly average of those and then we'll
put them on this graph over a over, uh, long term. So um, the top graph there, the single frequency, and this is um, the same solar burst, but the two, this person had two different antennas running there. But So that's one solar burst on that particular day. But um, you can imagine uh, if you got multiple bursts, like you see in the spectral plot there, these very weak lines there, vertical lines there, are solar uh, bursts. I think this, this happened to be on the day of the, the solar eclipse. The sun was quite active, and we're getting lots and lots of faint solar emissions you're able to have better counts and better better identification of what really is a solar burst because on the um, single frequency plot up there, you see the spikes uh, at the beginning of the uh, of this trace anyway, those are um, interference, local interference. Well, how do you know that, right? You, you, you've got to have some, some training to be able, to be able to identify what a solar burst looks like. And it's just easier to identify them on the spectral plot. Again, some training is needed to be able to identify these things, but it's, it's easier to identify them. We get better counts. So I'm hoping going forward, we'll have a, a, a better plot and I need, to, um, I need to crack the whip on a couple of my students and uh, get them to uh, give me error bars. Uh, I'm still waiting uh, on my, my error bars on these, uh, on my solar radio burst counts. So we, He's, uh, he's supposed to uh, work on that this summer. Um, we're, still, we're still able to meet, I'm still able to meet some of my students uh, with so social distancing and, and, and wearing masks and that kind of thing on, on campus, even though we're, we're still teaching this summer remotely. Um, if you're doing research, you're, you're allowed to be on campus and, and, uh, and do those kinds of things. So uh, that's, that's good, but it still it does, make it a little more difficult to <laughs> get, get things done. Um, so just a few more plots here, just uh, showing you some more advanced um, data, some spectral data showing you how, how Jupiter, um, the emissions of Jupiter, are, and this is in the upper right here, um, can be uh, very exotic. Lots of spectral structure there. And the plot, the red and the green plot on top that's taken with a professional observatory out in New Mexico, and the blue plot below it, AJ4CO, that's our colleague in Florida, with a single radio telescope uh, and a spectrograph. So you can get, uh, I take that back, he has two square arrays uh, connected together. But uh, you can get some really, really, with, with uh, fairly simple equipment, you can get some really good results there. And then the, the, the plot on the lower right there shows you uh, uh, where the galaxy is. So the, the galaxy is not, um, uh, there's a little variation in the galactic background due to where the center of the galaxy is in the, uh, is it really eight o'clock already? My goodness. All right, I'm gonna to try to speed along here. I apologize. I thought I was uh, I thought I was talking fast, but maybe maybe not. Um, it's so very good. Can, You're right. Okay, thank you. We, we can we can detect where the galaxy is, where when the galaxy comes up overhead, um, and so we see a, a hump in, in in the galaxy there. And then this one on the lower left is actually a terrestrial event. So we saw these. We, we, we call them lightning echoes, or, or they look like um, uh, Native American, you know, TP structures uh, as enhancements up and down. And we um, took a look at these things and tried to figure out why we would get these kind of signatures. And this was identified by one of our citizen scientists. And this is sort of, I, I guess, the goal of citizen science and, and now uh, uh, Radio Jove and, and of course myself and, and others trying to do publishable science, we got a paper just released um, on this event or, or this uh, the identifying what these structures are. And so that's, uh, that was a, a real proud moment really for, for Radio Joe. This is our, really our first journal published paper. And uh, so that's one of the goals of, of, of getting involved in citizen science is to, to 
learn something new, identifying something new, and maybe uh, add to the, the, the database of science knowledge for, for all of this. And I'm still working on the solar eclipse data. So we've had, you know, we had several um, sites around the country observe um, in, the, in the HF band, and we're seeing some differences at different sites, but statistically, I haven't been able to prove that the lunar shadow actually affected um, the local ionosphere at, at these different sites. So we're, uh, we're still working on that. And also, um, we are planning to do this sort of observation again for the 2024 eclipse. Uh, that's the plan anyway. Um, so this, this is just the, uh, a brief summary of the, of the, the, the first parts of uh, basics of Radio Joe, some of the citizen science that we do, and some of the partners that we have in, in doing that citizen science. And I wanna do this very quickly and just talk a little bit of the other projects that, that NASA is doing, uh, different types of citizen science, because um, boy, I didn't know all this was going on and it's some of this is really, really fantastic. So uh, citizen science is now, you know, being a little bit more tightly defined, but uh, you know, essentially, if you are interested in in helping a, a scientist, you want you volunteer and do something that might lead to um, science or a publication in science, you are then a citizen scientist. And you remember this? How many of you remember SETI at home? You, you remember that program? That that essentially, my feeling is kind of like the first. Citizen science, I guess maybe amateur um, comet hunters and uh, people who discover a asteroids, you know, from their backyard telescopes, they're citizen scientists. But in some cases, it's as simple as, hey, would you download this software and let it run and help us use your CPU to identify um, and search for life? Well, you, you, you wouldn't want to do that today, would you? Have I got some software I want you to download on your computer so I can so I can I can use your computer? You wouldn't do that. <laughs> Security was would be too uh, too uh, uh, too tricky, I think, to to agree to do that. But uh, citizen science, um, you can just Google it, and there's a NASA page now. There's a whole list of projects that are out there, and I just wanted to point out a few of these, so I'll go fairly quickly th through these. So they want people to analyze data. You know, part of this shift in NASA is that, you know, a a as you know, the, the, the amount of data that NASA and others are getting is so voluminous that they can't analyze all of it. So you've got to use artificial intelligence, but you also need humans in, in, in many cases to analyze these. And this is one example. So you use these um, NASA um, infrared survey data and you do it like a blink comparator, right? You look at one picture and another picture and you switch them on and off and you, you're looking for um, a, trying to identify um, objects that in the outer solar system. So <clears throat> apparently artificial intelligence can only do that so well and um, our eyes and our brain are very uh, adept at, at identifying these things. So that's one uh, project that you can do. Um, there's the Sun Grazer project. So uh, again, you're analyzing NASA data. These are space uh, spacecraft data and uh, in, in finding comets. Is they come in close to the sun and burn up and uh, uh, all the time. So by identifying these things, you can potentially identify where this comet comes from and maybe you know, learn a little bit more about um, uh, how comets work and where they come from and that, that kind of thing. So um, that's another one. You've got, uh, oh, this is a, a, a neat website called SciStarter. So a lot of these citizen science projects, think of this as a clearinghouse for identifying citizen science projects. So you can go here, you can register, it's, it's, it's free, but you, you then can find different projects 
um, group them, categorize them, you know, get, get teachers or students involved in some of these things. It's, a, it's just a, a neat portal to a lot of citizen science um, projects that are out there. Um, I point out libraries are a great resource now. You can, you can find citizen science, um, even equipment that you can check out, um, like rain gauges and things like that to do, to do uh, sort of backyard science. There is a guy at uh, NASA Goddard that is just captivated by way, different ways that he can um, use smartphone technology to do science. And, you know, smartphones have, of course, accelerometers in them. And then there's little dongles you can attach to give you a magnetometer or, you know, measure sound intensity, um, uh, light intensity, that kind of thing. So he's written a, a, a nice paper. And then you can see it's a whole guide, an experimenter's guide to using um, smartphones as, uh, as sensors. And this is, it's kind of daunting here, but you can see he's got chapters on, on, on these different things and uh, fun experiments that you can do uh, and uh, just using your cell phones. So that, that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, you probably heard of Globe at Night. This is a fairly famous one where you observe the sky either with just naked eye or binoculars or with telescopes. And you can contribute to um, uh, awareness not only of the local environment, weather, or uh, you know, pollution in the, in the sky, light pollution and, and otherwise. And sometimes that, that means just going outside and, and looking at stars and marking down what's the dimmest star that you can see on a particular night or, or whatever. So you, you look at you know, familiar constellations and things like that. And, and that's, a, that's a real simple way to uh, and then you, you you contribute your data to their database and they can use that to better understand light pollution or or, or um, real pollution I guess and and in some capacity there uh, and then that of course uh, spills over into observing weather um, mosquitoes or or, or other um, earth science so the globe observer program. <clears throat> And uh, you may not know, but there's a whole slew of uh, NASA um, accredited people called Solar System Ambassadors. And you can find these people. Um, and, and here's a picture of Tennessee. This was last fall. And then those are the Solar System Ambassadors across, uh, across the state of Tennessee. And then you can you know, find them and uh, contact them. And, and those people have materials. They have NASA uh, materials they can hand out or uh, you, they can visit schools and, and uh, or um, clubs like Orion. You could, you could find uh, solar system ambassadors to come in and, and speak to you about things. Aurora Saurus, if you're, I guess, lucky enough, fortunate enough to live in a, a maybe a Northern um, state or Canada or something, you, you can actually contribute uh, by observing Aurora and the, they've gotten a really a lot of pub publicity recently by um, some amateurs found these um, parts of an aurora that they'd never seen before, and they, they never understood what they were. And by their data, contributing to their data, and, and they got to name the thing, the acronym is named Steve, they, they actually helped um, uh, people who study the aurora uh, better understand, you know, the upper atmospheric phenomenon. So, so that's a, a, a neat a uh, neat program there. Galaxy Zoo, you probably heard of this one where you go online and learn how to uh, classify galaxies and help um, you know, better understand uh, things in the, you know, the distant universe. What kind of galaxies are more common or what, what's the differences about them? Um, boy, things like this, flu near you or mapping, coronavirus, all these things. It's really, really incredible um, what individuals can do. And uh, there's no way you can do all these, of course, but typically you, you, you become involved in things that you're, you're interested in and uh, that might be uh, um, you know, close to your, your heart, so to speak, or uh, things that you want to contribute to. 
um, there's there's great opportunities out there. Um, they have these family science nights where they get to, um, sort of like a facilitator to meet in a, in a large room and people uh, bring their children and everybody does an experiment together uh, at a particular uh, location, the, the, these events. So that's really a, a neat uh, a thing. You know, super advanced people can actually uh, take data from the Juno uh, uh, cameras and process these data. There's a couple of really, really good amateurs that have gotten uh, involved in processing um, the camera data. And so they've been published multiple times um, in, their, uh, in their efforts. So I'll leave you with this, you know, this slide here is that, you know, what can you do? What, what can you envision if you had a thousand volunteers or, or, or more? What kind of project or what kind of science could you do? And that's sort of what um, Radio Jove is, is moving towards and trying to do more citizen science and establishing a network of people who have Radio Jove um, receivers or the spectrograph receivers set up multiple locations and, and maybe we can uh, do a little bit more and answer some, some more questions. So sorry I ran a little long there, but uh, I really appreciate your attention. And uh, I'm happy to hang around and uh, answer some questions if, and I'll stop sharing my screen here. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to hang around and answer questions if you have some. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Jeff, we really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm just fascinated by, you know, I've, I've thought for a long time that the uh, time resolution of just a small piece of equipment coupled to a, a, uh, to a cell phone would give us continent-wide or worldwide uh, correlated data, even for, uh, for our interferometers in uh, lower radio frequencies, if we, if we chose to do that sort of thing. And I'm going to look up Stan Odenwald's uh, reference that you showed us. But has anyone really uh, coordinated large numbers of cell phones? Or are they still to the point of just using one of them for a certain type of, say, spectral or audio or whatever, or radiological or, or, or magnetic sensors? Um, I think they're, they're on the precipice of doing that, trying to get coordination there. And I think Sten is trying to, trying to do that. And, and so, uh, places like Galaxy Zoo is just is, is one example there where it's uh, by, by multiple people identifying the galaxies they, they actually classify them um, by, by using amateurs and so there's it, it creates a database uh, if, if people uh, in this this gal Galaxy Zoo is a platform so you can actually use a Galaxy Zoo platform and use it for cell phone uh, sound intensity measurements or something. So you can then have a, 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 a database that you build uh, very easily if people contribute to it. And that's the idea is that you make it something that people can do easily, send their data in or contribute their numbers or something and, uh, uh, and ask bigger questions. But uh, so I think they're, they're just beginning to do that kind of thing. And, and you know, Sten is uh, is the one that's sort of leading leading that effort, but you know how far he's gotten, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe we can find out, get him to uh, tell us about that sometime. That's just fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Sten Sten's a really nice guy, and, and if you and I'd be happy to contact him, or or you can contact yeah. him directly if if you like. But uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to to uh, talk with you guys. Yeah, if you have his his coordinates, then then let me know. I'll okay, you know. I'd be happy to. Thanks. The um, I'm curious about the um, lightning uh, studies of lightning, and I know they're a broadband emission, and I think they also emit in the 20 megahertz, but I'm not positive of that. But if they do, then what I'd like to be able to experiment in a safe way because uh, having equipment set up when there's lightning around may be a little tricky, but uh, I would like to be able to um probe the atmosphere through which the lightning travels through with my usual favorite thing to do is that spectral analysis and that reveals so much about the physics and I'm wondering if there is um I don't know topospheric I guess that would be and 
if there's any kind of uh, uh, unexplored phenomena yet about that that might be of interest and in, in maybe how to set up a, a Radio Jove or, or some other similar type, maybe a different kind of antenna would be better, but I don't know. That, that might work just as well. Um, but anyway, you have any thoughts about lightning investigations using Radio Jove? Well, that uh, that paper that I showed you um, on those, you know, those uh, the TP type signatures, right. right? That's that's exactly what that was. We're probing, so distant lightning, you know, reflects off the ionosphere, and it reflects uh, the angle is different at different frequencies, right? So if you know where the source is and you know where your observer is, you can do the ray tracing and figure out where the lightning is going and, and what part of the ionosphere it's reflecting off of. So, so that's, that's one, and, and you know, we're just getting started doing that. That was the first paper just to uh, really, really identify the phenomenon. And we're trying to carry it forward and, and better understand these signatures. Um, so that's, that would be my, my, my quick answer. And I don't know if you've, you look at the spaceweather.com website, but I it's, been been. A, it's been about a week ago, but there has, uh, you, you know about sprites, right? So these are the upper atmospheric lightning that yes. goes into, into space. Well, um, they've uh, identified sort of a green colored event that happens on above the sprites. And they didn't quite know what that was, but there's a, uh, one of our guys, who's a great photographer, he took some fantastic images of sprites and the green hue above it. Um, it's a, it's a, um, uh, that's a, that's sort of a. Uh, it's not fully explained why, where this, this, this green emission is coming from, but uh, it's most likely uh, atomic, you know, um, uh, emissions from, from. Uh, um, excited electrons, but still, you know, that, that would be something maybe to, to, to get involved with understanding sprites or, or the related uh, phenomenon more. Yeah, um, that would be exciting. I was going to ask you about the sprites and the elves. <laughs> and the elves, right, right. It's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. And, and of course, Aurora too. Uh, I, I don't, your, your, your latitude probably isn't uh, conducive for <laughs> studying Aurora. But. Yeah. I'm only at what 35 degrees north latitude. Yeah, we, we we need to get a shack in northern Canada, you know, and share it or something. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Don. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering. Is and I don't know what what this would take, but does anybody think about setting up large arrays of these antennas and trying to actually image at these uh, these wavelengths, or is that possible even? I suppose it is, but no, we're not thinking about uh, in imaging. We, mm -hmm. we are trying to get more uh, spectrographs set up in the HF, um, but trying to, uh, uh, the timing, you know, interferometry, the timing is really the, the issue here, but trying to do imaging at, at HF, I just don't, I don't see that. <laughs> in the near future. Um, but I guess it's certainly possible now, you know, now that they have these arrays, uh, larger arrays, like the long wavelength array and things, you, you could do some, you know, s some imaging there and, and low far in Europe and, and those are, I guess they're, they're doing better and better because the technology's improved where they can do um, uh, imaging, I guess, down to, you know, uh, I think LOFAR can image down to what, 100 megahertz or something along those lines. I, I, I can't remember the exact um, realm there, but it's uh, technology's improved quite a bit. So I, th I think that might be something in the not too distant future at, in the HF. Robert, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say. Um... I know like with interferometry, the timing is very important. And then if you've got a lot of amateur equipment and you don't know the exact latency of the different signals, tremendous problem. But maybe you could do something with a, a broadcast transmitter somewhere that is putting out a pulse 
every so often, and you can use that as a reference to compare the received signals from uh, various sources so that even if they weren't, even if you didn't know the timing as they arrive, you could put them in timing afterwards. Yes, yes, and, and that's a big problem for us now just to try to um, get our spectrographs. We're using GPS timing now, so everybody is on this, this same time. Um, but that's, yeah, there's technical difficulties there. And uh, the other issue I, I should have mentioned to, to, to you, Don, is that the ionosphere, you know, you lose phase um, through the ionosphere. And we've got examples of two, two uh, people observing that are 10 miles apart in Florida that are picking up Jovian emissions simultaneously. But when you look down to the scale of a second or a few seconds, one antenna or one site picks up the emission and the other site does not. And then other times they're beautifully correlated. And the, the only thing we can we can figure is that the ionosphere and it's it's a it's a it's a tough nut to crack what, what, what the ionosphere is doing because it is constantly you know moving. Were, were you attributing that to uh, to a uh, Faraday rotation or Faraday effect when you were talking about that? Did I misunderstand that? Well, there there is a Faraday rotation. Yes, we we do see that um, in the left and right circularly polarized emission. But I'm just talking about the ionosphere because it's it's continuously these plasma blobs are constantly moving, and you can get you know, scintillation, uh, focusing and defocusing uh, of radio uh, waves through the ionosphere, and then you can get absorption and then transmission. And it just seems to be, it's maddening trying to figure out why this site picked up this emission, but this site did not. As I said, you get some times where it's beautifully correlated when I guess the ionosphere is quiet, and then other times, the correlation is very poor and the equipment is identical and they're the, the two sites are very close to each other so it's uh, that's that's sort of an interesting question and a puzzle maybe to uh, to, to pursue it would be a refraction effect as we see on the bottom of a uh, swimming pool or is yes. it in the uh, shadow bands during a solar eclipse yes It'd just be that that's, a, that's exactly right and the the ionosphere uh, and of course we're down close to the, the ionosphere cutoff, you know, 15 megahertz or so. And so you're gonna get plenty of absorption there. And then at 20 megahertz, you should get lots of transmission, but you've got, you know, diurnal effects going on. And uh, yeah, it's really uh, sort of an interesting, um, it, there's lots of interesting, interesting things happening there. And we haven't made heads or tails of why, <laughs> why it's doing what it's doing, um, but that's, that's, uh, I guess, in part why we're doing this. Any other uh, questions? Everybody going to run out and sign up for a uh, citizen science project? We got to keep up with what you're doing with your students and uh, extend that to to some other colleges around the area. I think you could, uh, when you've got it down and you need people. And let it be known we could we could help get groups at other places that yeah. would interface there as students yeah, student. I, I would love it i i talked to some folks over at tennessee tech in cookville and i would love uh, they're going to try to get a radio jove kit set up and i would love to get a spectrograph on their site i would love to get a spectrograph at, at uh in knoxville or at Champion allen oh, yeah. uh, and that and that way we but here's the problem these SDRs are turning out, turn, turning into, to, to be uh, uh, not so easy to, to work <laughs> with. Um, we've got certain models that are working, but those, those mo and the technology is changing so fast, those models, we can't get them anymore. So the new models that come out, we, we can't get it to work with our software. So it's, we're in, we're in sort of a kind of, dog chasing the tail at the, at the moment here, but uh, we're kind of stuck in, in, in trying to expand the number of spectrograph stations that we have because we don't have the hardware that we need, the receivers, the radios that we can 
that we can use. Well, you just um, need one that's fast enough to do the direct conversion, don't you, without any, any mixing going on? I suppose so. You know, they're, they're trying to, um, they've got people working on SDRs for, um, um, they're, get, they're calling it the tangerine um, model of it or whatever. They're, they're, they're supposed to be good for space weather and, and for astronomy. Every time I hear hear from them, it's another year uh, before it's going to be ready. Yeah. You know, so uh, we'd like to get something that we can use now that's sort of off the shelf, but uh, we're having trouble finding these things. I don't know if the Lime, uh, the latest Lime SDRs will do that. We were running Raster, and of course we were at gigahertz frequencies mostly, but the yeah. front end, uh, if you took away all the local oscillators and mixers it was very fast and and the, the lime sdrs then i think they should they should go up to uh i should say they should go yeah with direct direct conversion not a local oscillator they should be able to sample uh effectively up to about 30 megahertz mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so they would do it but i don't know who's i talked with Bob down about that some he and i think i've talked about yeah it. and i uh, think somebody tried a lime uh sure. sdr and it's it i don't know why but it it, it didn't work for us but that may be something that we can modify I, I don't know yeah i don't know if the front end is precisely what's needed uh i think yeah. the, i think the first ones were but you know they got they got cheaper much cheaper then i don't know about the, the last ones yeah yeah it's fun i mean the technology is so incredible but it's it moves so fast it's hard to hard to keep up and if you're trying to do something you know uh more scientific and you need to get exact you know standards and and calibrations done at different sites you, you, you can't be using the latest 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 thing every every uh six months or something because then then you never get anything done <laughs> you know exactly <laughs> Okay, Chuck. Uh, anybody else? It was very, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. It's always good to uh, see you, David, and and, uh, and uh, others. John, I haven't seen you in a while, so it's good to see you again. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm happy to give an update or, or uh, you know, once we can, huh, boy, shake hands with each other uh, again. <laughs> I would love to come, come over again. Uh, to, to see you guys be great we'll look forward to that okay Me everybody too. this is well, thank you again <laughs> thank you thanks bye bye, folks. bye, -bye. Yeah. everybody stay thank safe <laughs> yeah chuck, chuck before you go i want to ask you a question was was uh yeah alex was alex smith still there and when you were at gainesville yes he was was he your advisor no. he was on my committee and yeah bob, he, bob laycock he, he, any chance yeah, he was still there. Now, my advisor was Tom Carr and George Lebo. Yeah, Tom Carr, boy, he's he was getting along. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now he passed in. Oh, I can't remember twenty eleven or it's been ten years or so. Yeah, Bob was and, in my Bob was in my class and would always go down to Arecibo to. Uh, it was always attractive to uh, think about going down there. Uh huh. Now, you, did you know that Bob passed away just here real no, recently? No, I didn't know that. Yes, yes, I got an email from somebody at, at Florida that uh, he passed. It, it probably was a few months ago. Oh, we got it. Really recent, yeah. I didn't know that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, Alex passed, oh, late 90s, I think. Is that right? Yeah. I, yeah, he had 50 years in at UF. Uh -huh, yeah. Well, he taught he an retired. experimental physics course down there, which I thought was really great. And I, I tried to uh, promote that at UT, and, and we did it for about five years, but it takes so much energy to do that and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it was but, a great uh, Yeah, yeah. And he, you know, he was a great photographer, too. Well, he, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he had, uh, he, he developed some, some he techniques. Renaissance, Renaissance man, I thought, yeah. Yes, yes. He, he developed uh, ways to hypersensitize uh, photographic film and plates uh, for astronomy, and uh, so and he transitioned from you know uh, using plates into digital okay. stuff before he retired. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
So thanks for that information. You're welcome. You're welcome. And what, what years you were down there? In the, I, in I was the, down there for uh, from 60 to 62. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, you would, you would recognize Tom Carr's name, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, most of the other Radio Joe folks were there that I'm working with now were there in the seventies. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, that was sort of the, the hotbed. I mean, they were doing a lot of stuff down there at that time, I guess. They'd get yeah. Thing. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, Alex Smith and, and Tom Carr, you know, built, the, um, the observatory in 57, you know, the, the radio, Jupiter emissions were discovered in 55. Right. And so they, they built the, their first antennas down there in 57, and they've been right. monitoring Jupiter pretty right. much ever since. Yeah. So they were very active in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked, then, to Carr, I talked to Carr, you know, when I was thinking about staying there to do my research, uh, PhD research, but then I, I wanted to come back to Oak Ridge and, and work here. Uh huh. Yeah. That's neat. Did you ever know George Lebo? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you know he know. he's still around. George George is still is around. He, I I, yeah. I talk to him every now and again. Well, you know he uh, <laughs> this will bore everybody to tears, but we had a, a tremendous softball team down there when I was there. <laughs> uh, not not just me, but there were four guys that, that were really good. One played at Oklahoma, and one was a baseball player at Stetson. And we used to beat the uh, the uh, uh, frat boys down there, and they couldn't believe oh, yeah? it. Could, well, George and another guy named uh, uh, Jake Leventhal, the last game of the season, we we stayed over for the uh, 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 the the final series and the the uh, tournament. Uh -huh. So we all stayed over a, f a few days to to make sure we got through that. And George and and Jake Leventhal ran together head on into each other oh and jake's uh, uh george's ear was completely gone when they and he was knocked out completely i ran from the softball field up to the to the uh, football uh stadium and uh the uh, football coach was having a meeting with with everybody there and i i just broke in <laughs> here's on my shorts and everything i broke in and he said we had a serious injury out on the out on the field and uh, so they they stopped and called the ambulance and George was in the hospital for a couple of days had to put his ear back together and Jake, right? had a, Jake had uh, like 20 something stitches in his in his eyebrow like this right here and wow. we had to come back and play the game the next day because it was the finals and and uh, so uh, this is a story here I won't forget so we were <laughs> there was a the, the last out of the game was a pop-up down the third baseline and the uh, the uh, field was such that it dropped off where you couldn't see down below there, and and the the referee ran out there, an umpire ran out there and, and watched it. And Jake Leventhal with this bandage on his head, he caught the fly ball, and that was the last out. <laughs> we won the tournament. <laughs> wow! But you know, guys, George, George never told me that story. Oh uh, well, yeah, he was he was knocked out. My wife was sitting with his wife and fam and child. And they were getting ready to go to Illinois the next day, and so they had to put off. Oh the wow! Travel. Yeah, yeah. George hey, Bob, Bob, remind me of your last name again. Comp Compton. Compton. Steve. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Next time I talk to George, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Tell him yeah. that. And yeah. Yeah. Ask we, him to we, get his side of that story. Oh yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> look at his, look at his ear. <laughs> it's, it's reconstructed. <laughs> I did not know that. That's, yeah. that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, he was knocked completely out. He wasn't moving. But anyway, wow. it was a great bunch of guys, and we, we used to get together periodically, but I guess I, uh -huh. most, most people are in. Are, are, uh, oh, that's neat. Anymore. That's neat. Well, that's great. I'm glad to, I'm glad to know you and, and uh, uh, hear that story. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. All, right, all right. Good night, all. Thanks again, David. Thanks again. Enjoyed it.